Uh, I am uh, Associate Professor of Political Science and the Acting Director of the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, uh, the two co-sponsors uh, for uh, this uh, session today on the aftermath of the BC election. Uh, before we begin, I just acknowledge uh, that we meet today virtually as we are uh, on the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples. Uh, UBC, of course, is located on the land of the Musqueam people, uh, but other participants, including myself, may be more likely or just as likely to be on the unceded territory of the Squamish or Sailtooth peoples in the lower mainland of British Columbia, uh, as well as, of course, elsewhere. And the election has returned 87 MLAs to the Legislative Assembly, which is on, in Victoria, of course, but on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen, uh, speaking people. Uh, so most of not all of our panel doesn't re re need much of an introduction to our audience, but I'll just briefly uh, introduce uh, everyone. Uh, Megan Diaz is here. Megan, Megan, sorry, Megan Diaz. My, I have a sister in law named Megan, sorry, Megan. Uh, she is a PhD student at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, she's a Vancouver uh, IT right now, though, so we thought it was nice to have her here. She's interested in questions around immigration, multiculturalism, and how we live and govern together in diverse democracies. And Me Megan did her MA at UBC, so that's how we know her so well. Uh, but also, she's worked with the Institute for Future Legislatures, part of the CSDI, uh, since 2017, and in fact, has helped us to reach out and has uh, been working with the IFL uh, at Ryerson for the last two years. So she helped us put it on in, in Toronto but very ably uh, as well. Catherine Harrison is here. Catherine is a professor of political science. Uh, people know her background. She has a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from the University of Western Ontario, master's degrees in chemical engineering and political science from MIT, and a PhD from UBC. Uh, she has lots of publications and lots of uh, recognition, uh, but I will just say that she works uh, and studies environmental, climate, and energy policy, federalism, and comparative public policy, but has an interest, of course, in BC politics uh, along those, uh, those issues. Uh, Richard Johnson is also here, finally, uh, Professor Emeritus. Uh, and normally we say when people retire, oh, we'll hope to get you back and see more of you. I've seen a lot of Dick over the last few <laughs> weeks, so it's been wonderful. We have not let our claws out of him at all because of all these elections that are going on. Uh, so we haven't even begun to let him go uh, from that uh, job as former Canada Research Chair uh, in public opinion, uh, et cetera. Uh, safe to say if there's been a question about an election on this continent, plus maybe a couple more uh, over the last uh, a few decades, he's on the short list of people you would want to consult about how to study it, uh, how to understand it, and so we're very lucky to have him with us as well uh, to deliver some of those comments on the BC election with precision and wit uh, that he's known for. So I'll say a little bit about uh, sort of the overall uh, picture of the election. I'm going to turn to Megan to talk about some of the things she noticed in the campaign, uh, then to Dick uh, to talk about some of the consequences of the campaign for voter dynamics, party dynamics, uh, and then finally to Kathy to talk about climate uh, issues, but other issues that sort of face an NDP government now empowered with the majority to, to go ahead. At that point, we'll have some time for q and I'll have a little bit of help, uh, but if you want to ask a question uh, when we get closer to that time, please uh, put it in the chat, either directly to me or in the open chat, and we'll moderate it from there. Uh, we may ask you to ask, ask the question, or you can, um, can have us ask it for you. So uh, my, uh, in my sort of five minutes, I'm going to say just a little bit about the BC election by the numbers, uh, if you will. Uh, with the House standings uh, with you know, leading or elected uh, as it remains because of the large number of mail-in ballots. Uh, 55 members of the New Democratic Party, uh, 29 BC Liberals and three Greens. Uh, that leaves, of that total, sorry, of 87, there are about 10 to 12 ridings that remain too close to call. Although uh, I see Colin Whalen is here and he uh, had a great t tweet the other day uh, highlighting that about four of those really are the ones that have potential to flip uh, based on the number of mail-in votes and the margin uh, that's there. The, a lot of those others are probably likely if the trend uh, pat continues the way it is in the popular vote are probably likely to be the same, stay the same. At least I'm relying on that when I tell people that that's what I think. So thanks Colin for that insight. Um, You'll notice uh, that a total of 55 NDP means that the, uh, the NDP are up 14, uh, including gains in traditional liberal strongholds like Surrey, uh, like Richmond, uh, even where I am on the North Shore. Uh, the Liberals are down 14, of course, and the Greens hold steady from their 2017 numbers, although one up from their total at the dissolution because they had lost uh, their former leader, Andrew Weaver, to uh, independence, uh, and he, of course, endorsed the NDP in the midst of the campaign. So that was an interesting dynamic going on there. 
The popular vote share is another interesting story, which I'm sure Dick will inquire into a little bit, uh, but the NDP right now are at about 45%, not topping uh, their 1979 total of 46%, which remember won them official opposition status, not government, uh, and not certainly a government with a majority uh, like they have. The Liberals were at 35% of the popular vote, Green at 15, uh, and almost 4% went to other, if just using the elections BC category, uh, but there's some really consequential others there in the form of the BC Conservative Party, particularly in some of those uh, Fraser Valley ridings, which another place that the NDP had some success in uh, that we weren't necessarily expecting, uh, and that uh, you know, totaling up the vote, uh, you wouldn't have necessarily expected either. Uh, all NDP incumbents were elected, re-elected. Uh, I think about 12 by my count, uh, Liberal incumbents were not. So uh, some uh, certainly big change uh, going on there. Other demographics of uh, the uh, the House that comes out of uh, this election, uh, 35 women leading are elected, a larger share of the NDP caucus is female uh, than the male, uh, than the, the Liberals, sorry. It uh, looks like uh, the numbers are holding steady at about 19 members uh, who are Black, Indigenous, or people of color, uh, including, uh, but including now the first turbaned Sikh member of the BC legislature. Uh, so that's uh, some uh, advancement there on that uh, file. Uh, 1.2 million people voted in advance or on election day, uh, 600 mail-in ballots or so still waiting to count uh, by November 13th or thereabouts. That puts turnout at about 52%, which is a uh, pretty, pretty big drop from 2017, obviously, uh, which was closer to 20, 62% of, of eligible voters. Uh, and it also, I would note, disrupts the trend line in BC, which has been to see steady uh, growth, not significant growth, but steady growth over the last few cycles uh, in the percentage of turnout that we were, 62 was higher than uh, 2013 and, and so on. Um, big headlines, and, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, obviously, the re-election of a B, an NDP government, so people who are maybe less familiar, uh, that's not a common thing <laughs> in BC politics. Uh, NDP governments get elected, but they don't necessarily uh, get re-elected, and, and so that's a, a big story, although they weren't formally elected. I guess it was a minority parliament that parliament chose that they were the government uh, after 2017. Uh, but also, the uh, an election of an NDP government without an utter collapse of the free enterprise coalition on the other side. When you look at 1991 and other in instances where the NDP won, it was because 50 plus percent of the vote was split between uh, Socreds and BC Liberals or some other iteration of that type. Uh, so the, the NDP have won historically when the Free Enterprise Coalition couldn't gather under one umbrella. Uh, here's a case where they were relatively uh, united under the BC Liberals, although some factions, of course, that, will, that came out during the campaign. Um, it's, so that's also about the implosion of the BC Liberal Coalition, uh, evidenced by its losses, obviously, in Metro Vancouver and the inability of its now resigned leader, who resigned uh, the other day, uh, to please social conservatives uh, and more economic factions uh, within the party, uh, and then also sort of disappointing, I think, uh, centrist voters who saw him acting far too slowly on social conservative uh, blips that came up uh, in the midst of the campaign. Um, the other, I think, interesting thing to note, just kind of going forward, is <laughs> that despite 16 years of wilderness in the opposition, and a relatively fresh, that the Premier has a relatively fresh slate with uh, the caucus that he was given by this uh, election. Uh, three and a half years would seem to be not enough for some of those people who were in opposition for a long time, uh, but seven cabinet ministers uh, chose not to run for re-election. Uh, and so the, the uh, Premier has an opportunity to fully renew his front bench almost uh, without displeasing anybody. He's not <laughs> taking anybody off a, a good job to give it to somebody else. He has a chance to uh, really lock in potentially a uh, Horgan era and maybe beyond uh, with the, the renewed uh, caucus with lots of young members uh, to choose from. And I would headline, as this is a BC, uh, UBC political science and alumni event, uh, that our former PhD graduate Grace Lohr is among that caucus. Uh, yay, Grace, uh, we're all very happy uh, for her being there and, and, uh, and we have high expectations of her being in cabinet immediately. Uh, so <laughs> we'll see. Um, there's challenges ahead, of course, uh, and Kathy will uh, address some of those. I'll say the word federalism before Dick does this time because he's been teasing me by slipping it in before I do uh, a couple of the events we've been working on. But I won't say more than that because uh, suffice it to say that policy challenges ahead uh, will really depend to some degree on coordination with the federal government, and that's a unknown to some degree uh, right now. Okay, so that's my very quick uh, by the numbers and um, I'll moderate from here on and not say more, uh, but I'm gonna turn it over to Megan to say a little bit about what she noticed in the campaign uh, from her perspective. Megan? 
Okay, thank you so much, Jerry, and, and thanks for having me here. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to be talking about BC politics and, and not US politics, as I've been forced to, to talk about for a while, so, so thank you. Um, I'm going to, um, to offer some thoughts around um, kind of dynamics around diversity um, and engagement in this election campaign and, and things we can consider going forward. Um, I also, you know, just want to start off by saying, I think although I'm talking about diversity and engagement kind of as specific issues right now, um, dynamics around that affect everything um, that we talk about this election, and I think they, they play a role in what Dick and what Kathy is going to talk about, so just keeping that in mind um, kind of as we go forward. Um, so, so Jerry um, already kind of gave an overview of the numbers and kind of like what the outcome was, um, how much the, the legislature that we elected looks like BC. Um, but to just go over that really quickly um, again, um, and, and think about kind of how, how, this, cha how this has changed since 2017, um, I think the story is it's actually very similar to 2017, um, but, but there are some, you know, some, some changes. Um, so 35 women were elected, that's one more than was elected in 2017, that puts us at about 40% of the legislature is now composed of women. Um, 19 non-white MLAs were elected, were elected, and that's the exact same number as last time, so, so no movement there. Um, and 13 Indigenous M MLAs, sorry, were elected, um, and that's one less than last time, so it's like a slight step back there. Um, and so really, really quite similar, again, some, some kind of movement, some significant things, such, like, um, such as the election of Amon Singh, who's the first um, Serban Teek, uh, Teek, sorry, um, to be elected in BC, um, and as you know, uh, moving towards a legislature that looks like BC, I think that's that's super significant. Um, but a lot of the story is kind of looks pretty much the same as 2017. And so questions of how did we get here? What happened in the campaign around these kind of issues? Um, and this is the second campaign that the NDP has run with their equity mandate. Um, so their equity mandate, you know, they put forward saying we're, we're going to do this um, in order to demonstrate our commitment to having a more diverse politics, to having a party and a legislature that looks more like BC. Um, I think two elections in, we can start thinking of, you know, how much is this working? How much is this not working? What else does the party need to do to, um, to encourage kind of more diverse voices in their party? Um, and, and specifically thinking of, you know, now that they're in government with a majority government, um, who are they going to put at the cabinet table? Who's going to have leadership roles and actual power in government? Um, so I think that's something to kind of think through. Um, I think the story with the BC Liberals is maybe a little different. Um, they, they do not have an equity mandate. Um, that, that showed in a lot of cases. Um, you know, in, in Vancouver, they only ran um, male candidates, and that was something that voters noticed. Um, that was something that, you know, for a party that wants to be a big tent party, wants to say that they're speaking for and to all of BC, I think that's, that's not getting off on, on a great foot. Um, and then they had, you know, just specific instances of, of scandals and kind of things that made um, voters question that their commitment to kind of equity and diversity and inclusion. Um, the scandal with the, um, or you know, maybe mini scandal is, is a better term, but but with um, Jorn, uh, Jane Jane Thoroy's comments about Bo and Ma and uh, Andrew Wilkinson kind of sitting there silently um, with a number of uh, BC Liberal candidates uh, making comments or not supporting kind of issues in the LGBTQ community that really I think hurt hurt the Liberals there. Um, and as much as the Liberals, uh, you know, wanted to make the election about the economy or the NDP's mishandling of uh, the pandemic or taxes or anything else, it just kept coming back to problems within the caucus or problems within the candidates of, of the BC Liberals. So I think that's something that they have to think through going forward. And there's already, you know, prominent members of the BC Liberal Party who are saying, we need to do better on this. We can't win unless we fix this. Um, so something to kind of think about um, and notice what they do in the next four years there. And then moving to kind of voter engagement in this election, um, as Jerry said, uh, voter turnout was really low. Uh, voter turnout was 51.2%, uh, which is nine points lower than it was in 2017. And it's actually like 
the lowest it's been in almost 100 years. So very low. Um, and I, I don't even want to say that I'm, that I'm disappointed or surprised because I don't think we should be. I think, you know, there was a lot of factors working against engagement in this election. You know, this is a snap election that people weren't prepared for. This is an election where there's a lot on voters' minds. There's a lot competing for their attention. There's the pandemic and people, you know, struggling with, with their own jobs and housing situations. Um, there's so much news going on from the South, from other parts of the country. Um, there's the pandemic. Um, and so I, I think there was just a lot competing for voters' attention right now. Um, and the ways that we were able to do voter engagement was just different this election. Parties weren't able to hold rallies. They weren't able to door knock. We kind of lost out on that. Um, and, and a lot of the kind of like the nonpartisan, the advocacy groups, the civil society groups that do a lot of this work, um, they, you know, I, I, um, I've done voter engagement uh, campaigns in BC before. And, and when the election was called um, this year, I, I reached out to some of them. It's like, okay, what are you doing? How can I help? And a lot of them were like, this is really hard. Like, we can't mobilize with only a couple of days notice. We can't mobilize during a pandemic where now we have to figure out how to do things online. And so I think we also just lost out on that aspect of engagement and a lot of groups that do um, try to engage marginalized or traditionally underrepresented voters um, were not able to participate in this election. And we don't know, like, I don't, Elections BC hasn't released because they're still counting ballots. Um, the turnout numbers for, you know, broken down by age, ethnicity, um, education, income. But, but I'm scared to see those numbers because I think, you know, just given a lot of these dynamics, I'm not sure how, how widely voters were engaged this election. Um, so just some like final brief concluding, uh, concluding thoughts on SNAP elections. Um, when thinking about you know, both diversity and inclusion and engagement. Um, when they're, you know, at the beginning of this whole process, when the NDP were, you know, there was rumors that the NDP was gonna call the election, um, Sonia Firstino kind of came out and said, if the NDP cares about diversity in BC politics, they won't call this election because it takes time to recruit diverse candidates. It takes time for people with different responsibilities and lived experiences to get ready to run for office. And so you can't, if you call a snap election, it's gonna be a less diverse election. Um, and I think, you know, in some ways, maybe we can save that played out. In some ways, maybe the snap election was the reason we had the BC Liberals only run 20 men um, in Vancouver. Um, but I think also we have to think through, it shouldn't just be that parties are trying to engage these diverse voices, these people in the days or weeks leading up to an election. Like this needs to happen as an ongoing process. And I think we need to look for what are parties doing in between elections to build up these, uh, these relationships. Um, and, I, and same with, you know, looking at the NDP right now, what are they doing to support the diverse voices and people who are in their party and elected right now? Um, and same thing with turnout and with voter engagement. I don't think it should be that we're, we're rushing, um, you know, scrambling the days before the election to say, okay, how are we gonna mobilize? How are we gonna engage voters? I think we have to think through, you know, how can we build up an infrastructure that this is an ongoing process between elections? Um, and, you know, I hope, like knock on all the wood, I hope that we don't have another pandemic election in BC. Um, but we're probably going to have more staff elections going forward, and I think we need to be better prepared for that to make sure that they are diverse, inclusive, and engaging, um, even given the SNAP election circumstances. Great. Thanks, Megan. Maybe I'll just have a quick follow-up question. I mean, do you, do you feel um, that, uh, that a SNAP election was something of an opportunity to, you know, I mean, the, the, the one example from the NDP was the Nathan Cullen nomination, right? So here it's yeah. a sort of star who was violating essentially their own equity mandate to do that. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously you didn't call an election for one candidacy, but you know, did, did the snap election help uh, to sort of bury that story fairly quickly? Um, and then also, you know, Greens calling the kettle black. <laughs> you know, did they? I mean, they had probably one of the least diverse sets of candidate candidates. So, uh, what do you have to say about that? Interesting. 
Yeah, I mean, and I, I think, um, you know, the, the NDP equity mandate isn't, isn't perfect and it's not the full story. And I think obviously the, the Cullen example is something where they didn't need to do that and that betrayed their own, um, their own values. It might have been more of a story if the BC Liberals didn't have so many scandals around this. And even, you know, Nathan Cullen did get into that controversy um, regarding his use of an Indigenous leader's name. Um, but that, you know, and, and John Horgan said, I don't see color. Um, but, but that, you know, they were able to apologize really quickly and, and there was so much else going on that I think they were, the BC Liberals kind of owned that part. They were seen as the ones who had a problem there and the, the NDP were able to kind of move past their issues really quickly. Um, with the Greens, 100%, I mean, I think that they're, the, the charity we can give them is that um, Sonia Furston was only elected a week before the election, right? And so they did really have a challenge to, to field candidates at all, um, much less, you know, do the work. Um, and, and I don't think we should excuse anyone for not doing the work. And I think we, we have to see that again in between elections, but, um, but the, the Greens had a, had a tough time. I mean, it illustrates your point that it does take time and it takes investment to it's something that they have a challenge uh, doing in the first place. Great. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Dick. Thanks, Jerry. So I have three slides that I want to share. Let me just load them. I couldn't function without my crutch, you know. <clears throat> okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about three things, one per slide. One is uh, a little bit about um, what exactly the um, what exactly voters were approving, uh, if they were in the uh, incumbent NDP government. Um, second, I wanted just a, a preliminary dip into vote swings from 2017 to 2020. Uh, obviously, these what we can say is very limited by the fact that we haven't actually seen the totality of the pattern yet. We, we, we await all the mail ballots. Um, and then I actually want to step further back and just say a couple things about the historical pattern. Uh, so this, so we'll talk about swings between 1903 and the present, uh, but, but really to raise the question about whether there is a fundamental change uh, now in the underlying character of the, the BC party system. Whether whether the era of fusion politics is behind us or not, Jerry, you made a point about this actually, uh, so I want to expand on that. So first one, this is just a an attempt to reconstruct the time path of intentions from the last election to the present. Um, this is a smoothing function with confidence intervals. You can see the data pattern is quite sparse, so it's kind of a mess. But um, and I've I've just I've just flagged the moments over the last uh, three and a half years that might have been significant. So uh, the first one is the accession of Wilkinson to the head of the Liberal Party. It doesn't seem to have had much effect in and of itself. Um, but you can see that in the span, the kind of the middle period, you know, the NDP was sort of held its own. The Liberals did seem to lose ground. And there was some sense in which they might have gotten reelected had those patterns continued. Um, not in a particularly stunning way. Uh, so then another question is, does the uh, resignation of, of Edward Weaver and the rather long interregnum uh, for the Greens, is that part of the story of the, the, the Greens initial retreat? And the answer seems to be no, uh, that that Green retreat really took place at the same time, more or less, as the NDP advance. And so then what does the NDP advance about? Is it the pandemic as such, or is it the relatively light hand on the economy that the BC NDP was able to establish, partly by having a more complete lockdown in the first phase? I mean, we just didn't screw up the way everybody else did. I mean, I think uh, the, the approval ratings of the Premier of Quebec are stunning when you consider what a shit show that province is, a higher death rate than in the US, for God's sakes. But here we are. Um, the it's but it's hard to tell right so the the the, the global pandemic actually is uh, announced on if you look down the the the, um, 
the uh, horizontal registers is days to election. So the global pandemic is right about there. Uh, and there's a gap in voting. So we don't really pick up polling until the 5th of May, which is before the announcement of phase two. So phase two was announced on the 18th of May, and that's when the economy starts to reopen to the extent that the BC economy is more open than in any of the other provinces. And it is natural to wonder, is, is it the overall management of the pandemic, or is it the particular fact that, that we had a more optimistic world out here, at least for the summer, than in some of the other provinces? Um, and uh, in any case, there's almost nothing further to say about the campaign itself. If I, if I were to focus on that uh, narrow period after the dropping of the writ, there's essentially no dynamics to speak of, except possibly a tiny green uptick at the end. Uh, but it does make one wonder uh, how much of the how much of the popularity of the government was a function of the combination of a heavy hand early and a light hand late. And now that we're starting to see a serious spike in cases, and a serious spike in cases in the very places where the NDP made its greatest gains, south of the Fraser River, uh, largely to do with social events, uh, one wonders whether there's a crash about to happen here. So they, you know, they may have escaped this thing by the skin of their teeth. They've, they've, they've got themselves a handsome mandate, but the, the, uh, there's a, there's a, it, to me, it deepens the tone of manipulation that hangs around this event. Uh, normally, I'm resistant to what you might call the evangelical impulse in assessing parliamentary government. I am a Westminster guy. I don't know that I really want to mess with the balance of power between government and opposition here, but I can't, even I have to admit, this one stinks a little bit. Uh, so anyway, uh, on to the next slide. So this is just a preliminary attempt to get at the swings, okay? So the horse, so liberals and NEP, the horizontal axis is just a 2019 share as a cast as a proportion. The vertical axis is the swing. That happens to be in uh, percentage points. And in each case, there's a tiny negative relationship between the previous position and the and the swing, slightly negative. That that in itself doesn't mean much. Often we we observe a kind of regression artifact, a kind of recession or regression to a previous mean, if you will. But it is kind of interesting to know where these places are. And I haven't, I haven't labeled these as, effect, as efficiently as they might be. But let me just point out a couple spots on the map. If you can see the cursor, wherever the cursor went, where the hell did the cursor go? Let me see. It's not, OK, we'll look at the NDP first. It's less interesting, I would say, than the Liberals. Um, so the, the biggest positive swing for the NDP up there at nearly 25, um, and a relatively show, relatively low NDP share. That's Murray Rankin taking Oak Bay Gordon Head away from the Greens, basically. So it's the subtraction of Andrew Weaver and the insertion of a very prominent former federal MP and sort of Victoria celebrity. Um, if you look around, uh, sort of uh, on the negative side, uh, sort of around 55 or so, and minus minus three or four percent. There's your equity man. <laughs> That's Nathan Cullen, uh, who, who did uh, manage to lose votes for his party relative to the last time out. I don't think we want to make too much of that, but, you know, and, and in the end, of course, they were so far ahead, it didn't matter. Um, uh, the, the big NDP gains are where you would expect them to be, given the, given the seat results. So if you kind of look at the at the sort of area, uh, you know, sort of five to 10 points uh, vertical gain. It's, it's in the places where the party was already relatively strong, but not quite there in terms of taking all the seats. And that's sort of the, the outer reaches of Metro Vancouver plus Lower Fraser Valley, right? So the, you know, appearances are not deceiving there. Uh, the, the NDP made serious gains in that area. Now you go to the Liberals, Again, I wish I had the, I wish I could recover my cursor. I don't know what happened to it. But anyway, if you go to the liberals, I think actually if, if I were to label these things or, or, or indicate them by region, they would point to a very serious problem for the party that is not adequately captured 
by all the commentary about the party uh, adapting too slowly to the modern age. Right? That in fact, the biggest drop for the liberals is down there on the, on the right hand corner. Right? That's Peace River. That's where the leader of the Conservative Party ran, the guy, the, the, the um, Burger King fella who, uh, who stood aside whilst one of his employees harassed another. Uh, but he did pretty well. And the fact that the liberals chose to tweet about him, I think, indicated their nervousness about their right flank. And they should have been nervous. Because if you look at the, the, the three of the four blue dots closest to the bottom of that chart, three of those four blue dots are in seriously liberal writings that uh, are kind of agricultural and conservative. One of them is Vernon Monashi, which may be a bit of a different story, but still, that, that, that the, the, the liberals obviously lost practically everywhere, but they're, 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 they lost least, wait for this, they lost least in the areas where the NDP made their biggest gains, right? So the NDP soaked up a lot of what was not already in the, soaked up a lot of what was not in the major party camp. But the Liberals didn't lose that much, okay? So in the places where you would think they paid a price for not being sufficiently diverse, they didn't actually pay that big a price in a sense. The, what, they was, what happened was that they're outflanked by the NDP. That may be a temporary matter or it may be part of a trend. We don't know, we don't have enough data points to know that. Uh, but they are, I think, at serious risk in their heartland. Uh, you know, those, those folks will support them if they have no alternative, but I think that there's a question about whether an alternative will appear or reappear, and that takes me to my last slide. This is, a, this is a, the last in a sequence of slides, actually, that I produced for a student event last week, so it's, it's ridiculously overcomplicated. Granted, as a sequence, but I don't have the time. But what this is, is the, the totality of the PC party system from the dawn of time to the present. The dawn of time being 1903, the first election in which uh, uh, candidates for office labeled themselves and organized themselves by party. This is the era of Sir Richard McBride. And um, I, I won't dwell on the details, but the basic point is follow the orange line, first of all. That's the CCF and NDP. Right, um, BC was an early uh, adopter, you, will, you might say, for labor politics, coal mines, all that sort of stuff. But 1933, the the CCF popped into existence as a major party, as the official opposition. Don't talk to me about Saskatchewan. Right, this is the real stuff for the long run. BC, a real labor party in a in a, in a kind of real sort of primary industry electorate. And the, the CCF bumps along in the 30s for the next 40 years. Uh, and then in 1972, Dave Barrett, they, the NDP pops up to 40, and the NDP is essentially, except for 2001, the NDP has essentially been in the 40s ever since, right? The high point being 1979 uh, at 46%, but, but un unable to defeat the, the, the social credit at 49. But each time there's a shift in the NDP, there's some kind of shakeout in the rest of the party system, right? So after the, or CCF, after the appearance of the CCF, we have a 20 year period of, of drift with the coalition in the middle there. Um, the coalition then uh, basically blows apart and social credit takes over, but social credit soaks up all the, all the anti-socialist elements of the electorate. There is a hiatus in 72, uh, at the end of the WAC Bennett period, but again, Bill Bennett uh, basically absorbs the liberals and conservatives. That government is dominated by liberals, right? It's the, it's the UBC varsity basketball team from 30 years before, basically. Uh, and, uh, but that, that new social credit party doesn't take care of the base. And so all the kind of business folks who reshaped it allowed it to get out of their control and it became the old social credit party and that's the crisis of, of 1991. Of course, the, the Liberal Party steps in as the party of the center, right? Gordon Wilson dramatizes uh, the debate in which he is barely allowed to participate as 
exemplifying the polarization that British Columbians are sick of, and so they vote accordingly, sent a clearly centrist signal, whereupon Howe Street captures the party. We used to talk about Howe Street because remember when there were head offices in Vancouver, and remember when there was a stock exchange? Well, that's Howe Street. Anyway, and then, and then you get this blip of 2001, the punishment uh, basically of Glenn Clark, uh, uh, and notice a previous high point for the Greens because, you know, people who couldn't vote liberal went to the Greens as a protest vote, but then the NDP bounced back basically. And although it's lost a little bit of ground, what's striking is that, the, that from 2005 to the present, sort of the consolidation and of, the, of the Campbell coalition, the liberals have actually been losing ground down to 2017. And um, while we tend to talk about the Greens as somehow part of the left, they're really the center. And they're in many ways a parking spot for disgruntled liberals and disgruntled New Democrats, I would say. And that goes to an issue about what the future of the Greens is. I don't have a whole lot to say, but the, but the whiteness of the Green candidacy is, is not just an issue of the snap election. Right? They, have a, they, they have a problem, it seems to me, in, 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 a, in a BC electorate constituted the way it is. Uh, but in any case, my final question really is, uh, the history down to the present uh, has been one of fusion politics, right? That, that uh, any sort of enhancement of the NDP threat pr forces pressures for fusion. When the NDP threat is moderate, as in the 1930s to the 1970s, uh, there's, there's room for a Liberal Party on the flank, and the Liberal Party of, of my youth and early adulthood was the real opposition. They were incredibly competent MPs, but there was no room for them as a separate party once the NDP got into the 40% into the range. And then uh, there was no room for social credit once social credit fell apart, and so there was a, there was a complete banishment and initial absorption of, of uh, the conservative parts of the BC electorate into the Liberal Party, creating this incredibly tense coalition that we have now. And so the question is, will there be indeed pressure for fusion, as there has been in the past? And if so, how will it be resolved? Because I think the Liberal Party, as it's constituted right now, has a serious problem in trying to execute that. And, and if it's supplanted by a BC party or a conservative party, it'll have the same problem in reverse. So maybe we're poised for a qualitative change in the BC political landscape and end to fusion politics. I don't know what. Uh, I'll, I'll just conclude by observing that I, I wrote a paper, I wrote a piece for the IRPP about how one might go about electoral reform in this province, in which I suggested that the NDP A, take ownership of it, and B, invite conservatives to the table and get them to consider the possibility of being able to vote conservative without having to elect Christy Clark or her equivalent. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Dick. Um, I will note the, uh, the presence yesterday, I think, and then today, uh, Jazz Johal, who's kind of in that centrist, diverse side of the BC Liberals, saying we have to renew in this direction. And then Kootenay Bill tweeted this morning saying, if we don't, if we don't can't fix the BC Liberal Party like people out in the Kootenays who want a Conservative Party, we need to go to the Conservatives. So uh, there's that tension in two prominent well, I, I, names. Uh, the BC Liberal He's a sharp commentator, I must say. Yeah. So so that'll be uh, very interesting to watch uh, as that goes forward. Thank you, uh, Dick. Uh, Kathy. No slides. Um, first off, just some reflections on the pandemic election, and then I'll turn to looking forward as, as promised. Um, one of the things I was struck by, you know, unusual situation in a pandemic election, especially when the opposition parties had basically committed to a nonpartisan response to the pandemic. So, you know, the, the NDP gets to claim the success and the, the opposition had had lower visibility. But in addition, there, um, there were dogs that didn't bark in that we're in an economic crisis, which last time round in, 20, um, in 2009 saved the Liberal Party, got them reelected under Gordon Campbell um, because voters 
have trusted the you know, business-oriented free enterprise coalition to manage the economy, but the nature of this crisis is different. Um, and the, the scale is such that all of the parties are calling for um, an economic stimulus on a scale that you know, we haven't seen in generations. Um, so I think that disadvantaged the liberals, but also even the idea that in BC, we still talk about the free enterprise coalition. When I moved here decades ago, I thought that was just bizarre. Um, but it's continued to work for a long time for the, for the liberals. Uh, and their predecessors, because they depicted the um, the new Democrats as you know crazy big spending radicals, and I think that didn't work this time round because both you know the liberals themselves were proposing huge spending, but also because the Horgan government hasn't been radical, um, and so the the kinds of um, scaremongering just wasn't wasn't taking hold. Um, What's coming down the pipe? Well, you know, they've got their majority and now the NDP is going to have to deal with a lot of stuff. Um, COVID, uh, where, you know, as Dick mentioned, we're um, well into our second wave. One of the things I'm struck by um, comparing provinces is that light touch that BC has been taking under um, Bonnie Henry. Uh, using persuasion rather than mandates on things like bars and masks um, is actually sort of setting us apart from some of the other provinces. Um, and I, I don't know how comfortable I am with being a natural experiment on persuasion versus mandates in dealing with the pan pandemic. But we'll see how that one goes. Um, housing affordability is still a top of mind issue for many voters. We didn't hear very much about the opio op opioid crisis in the election, um, the liberals kind of depicted it as a crime issue, but in fact, the number of overdose deaths has, has gone back up. In 2020, we seem to be on track to surpass the peak years of 2017 and 2018 in terms of number of deaths. Um, maybe not the, the kinds of policies that might be effective and that the NDP might be inclined to embrace on a bigger scale going forward might not be ones that they wanted to run on, but we might see some movement there um, in terms of provision of a safe drug supply to uh, people who are addicted. Um, and climate change, which is the other existential crisis that we face. It hasn't gotten any better. Um, it still looms large. Um, before I get to climate, the one other thing I'll mention is we're in this period of big spending, um, but there will be a comeuppance, and it will probably be before the next election, when governments federally, provincially have run up massive deficits, and it's time to start taking stock, um, and likely the NDP will own that deficit, and the liberals will um, will. Uh, We'll try to hold them to account for that. Uh, deficits and efforts to um, reduce government spending don't bode well for harmonious federal provincial relations either, as the federal government tries to control its spending by clawing back transfers to provinces. So on environment and climate, um, I think we've seen the, the platforms of the Greens and the NDP were, I mean, there were differences between them, but they weren't as big as the differences between those two parties and the Liberals. Um, the stuff coming at the NDP in the next four years, their immediate task is to come up with a plan to meet our existing 2030 target, something they promised to do by December. 25% um, of the reductions are still not accounted for. Um, I'm not holding my breath to see that plan in December. Um, the NDP platform had a lot of um, ambitious nerdy policies in there about vehicles and building retrofits. Also the promise of a lot of money for industry subsidies without as much detail there. So I'm gonna be watching how much money they're throwing at in many cases, very carbon intensive resource industries. TMX may well heat up. The pipeline's got all of its approvals, but there's been an uptick in arrests, um, including of indigenous uh, peoples who are protesting the land um, developments on their unceded territory. And so where that will go and how that will overlap with um, indigenous reconciliation and the, the provincial UNDRIP legislation remains to be seen. 
Um, the NDP has said they can reconcile the emissions in BC from LNG development with their climate targets. Show me how. Um, I think they were probably counting on um, the Paris Agreement international credits rules being settled by now. Um, the timing of that, we'll let you know by the end of 2020, is consistent with that. Um, so we'll see what happens there. Site C is um, a, an albatross that is getting bigger, um, and there will be a review of the carbon tax. Um, in the next two years in conjunction with um, federal and, and provincial governments, sort of climate politics will heat up again in about a year, as if it's calmed down um, in Canadian federalism. Um, and I'll close with just some thoughts on the Green Party. Um, and they were certainly at a disadvantage for a bunch of reasons going into the election, Weaver's departure, and he had really fashioned the Greens as a in his vision, a more centrist party that would be an alternate to either the, the um, Liberals or the Greens. First and now was chosen as leader just a week before. They were the junior partner in a supply and confidence agreement. Um, but the big one is that electoral reform didn't succeed. So the Greens were able to hold on, we think, to their th three seats. It looks like their vote share was fairly stable, maybe down a bit. Um, the number of ridings where they finished second went from four, I think, uh, in the last election to 11 this time round, which looks good, except if you look more closely at them, um, almost all of those ridings are ones where it was an NDP blowout. And the, it was a riding where the Liberals weren't remotely competitive and the Greens were kind of a distant second choice. So in some ways, they've recreated themselves post Weaver as a greener New Democratic Party. And if that's the case, um, what they need to rely on for prominence um, and you know holding their vote in four years is the NDP screwing up on the green file. And that's quite a poison pill <laughs> for Greens in that you know their their party doing well may depend on the planet not doing well. And I will end with that. Well, gee, Kathy, thanks for this optimistic moment to finish. <laughs> well, I, you know, I actually think the NDP did some really big and good stuff in their previous term. So, you know, I think there are ways that they can screw up, but I also think there's ways that they can um, continue to lead on climate within the Canadian Federation. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy, for those comments as well. Um, I'm just going to add one more comment that I forgot from my initial ones. Uh, and so Twitter today, Philip Lagasse and I were talking with uh, with, with Norman Spector uh, about uh, this extended caretaker period that the government has chosen to implement. Uh, Philippe and I both agree that they don't need to stay caretaker anymore. Uh, they can they can go full. You know, it's, there's no alternative uh, government here. They can start. Uh, but I wonder, you know, after your comments now, Kathy, it, I think. Uh, the, the challenges of some of the immediate decisions, including the decision about when to when to deliver this $1,000 promise, are ones that they're already a little bit hesitant about, <laughs> uh, and they're buying a little bit of time before Christmas, I think, to you know, bring the legislature back and, and start, and so Site C, there's a report coming in, right, in November, presumably, uh, so there's all kinds of stuff already that there seems to be some hesitancy about diving into, uh, and there's gonna be a cabinet to make and all the rest, and so all the, the demons of coalition on the successful side, I think, are already uh, sort of showing themselves uh, for the NDP. So, uh, so thanks, Kathy, for that. Um, we have uh, some uh, questions I should get to. Um, maybe I'll start uh, if anyone wants to say anything about, uh, well, uh, maybe Dick, you could say something a little bit about the uh, the way the, the BC Conservative vote played out in some of those ridings. You mentioned uh, the ones up north, uh, but uh, how much was the BC Conservative uh, vote a factor in the NDP success in the Fraser Valley, for example? Um, I think there's probably three writings that the Liberals lost because of Conservatives. I mean, you, you know, again, you could, you really want to have the flow of individual votes, but I can't imagine that there were a lot of people going to the Conservatives from any party other than the BC Liberals. And so, um, Chilliwack, not Chilliwack Kent, but Chilliwack, I think is one of those. Langley, Langley East rather, and, and it's interesting, it's, you know, it's, 
the, the, the one of the two um, very conservative MLAs singled out that lost that uh, lost their seats here, and then and then you know the the loss in Chilliwack Kent was well of course loss. I mean, what what does one say about that? Um, but I think they will lose it. I, I must I must assume from the pattern of um, requests for. Uh, mail-in ballots that Patton's lead will grow in Chilliwack Kent. But anyway, I, I, I make it three writings. I can't off the top of my head remember the third. But, uh, you know, so uh, the if, if you just think about where the NDP seat share sits on a kind of curve of relationship of seats and votes estimated across a bunch of elections, they should have got like 51 or 52 seats. Instead, they got 55. And I think that's it, that's it there. Um, the other big losses were like Peace River, where you could absorb a big hit and still hold the seat. But I think that that's a you know that's still very symptomatic of the underlying coalition problem that the party has. Uh, just on coalitions, I mean, as 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 is implicit in Kathy's remarks, I mean, the NDP is a coalition in the sense that if you think about what the middle class, uh, you know, sort of right-thinking members of the NDP are about. They're not about labor politics, they're about something else. And in, in environmental politics, in some ways, is the expression in our time of the transcendentalism of which North American environmentalism is a part. And so there's a tension there. It was a tension that was visible in the 1990s, especially once Glenn Clark pushed Mike Harcourt out. Uh, and so, you know, this is a, uh, so they have coalitional politics of their own to play. It's just a less, fundamentally incoherent coalition than one between social conservatives and social liberals. So uh, in the run-up to the 2017 election, I believe it was, the New York Times declared that British Columbia was the wild west of political finance, uh, somehow not acknowledging the United States <laughs> and the rest of it. Uh, but uh, we had comprehensive campaign finance reform, right, it just in terms of uh, the union and, and, and uh, corporate donations to the parties. Uh, no one said anything about that. Does anyone want to say something about uh, what effect they saw of uh, those limits and the more sort of uh, level playing field, obviously, that uh, the parties had in, in the 2020 election? Takers? <laughs> We're looking to you, Dick. <laughs> What oh, you muted, Dick. No, you're still muted. <laughs> there you are. Sorry. Uh, yes, I think it mattered. <laughs> they didn't have the bucks they had in previous elections. I, I, I haven't done the arithmetic on how much the per vote subsidy compensated for that. Probably quite a bit, actually. Um, but yeah, the, the party's gonna have to adapt to this new reality. And maybe Overall, I think we saw less spending, right? By all parties, just in terms of yes. a pandemic election as well. Like uh, even the buses, I don't think had the logos on the side. They were, you know, that was just a, a cost that was too much to bear, I guess, under the terms of, uh, of a short uh, election and, and maybe not even getting the, graph, the, the, uh, the, the images out of it that they maybe were hoping for. Uh, we got some questions in the comment. You can see yourselves if you want to. There's one that uh, you want to look at specifically. Um, or I can continue to sort of put them together. One thing I'm struck by in announcing the cabinet is um, the, the NDP caucus is likely to be about half women. Um, but, you know, Mr. Horgan faces, and so it will be very hard for John Horgan to introduce a cabinet that isn't half women, but he's got a bit of a challenge in that four of the seven front benchers who retired from politics were women, including the finance minister and arguably his three highest profile star candidates in this election are men. Um, so, you know, how does he make room for most or all of those guys and also look to, um, you know, including uh, women members of the NDP caucus who weren't in cabinet last time, but have now got um, three years of um, being parliamentary secretaries and stuff under the belts. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, 
he's also signaled his intention to try to reach out uh, to the rest of the province. And so the kind of classic cabinet representation issue of, of having people from farther afield than just the lower mainland and, and Vancouver Island. And again, that probably sways more mail uh, than the other way around, but he wouldn't, I don't think he would depart from the precedent now of having, um, you know, a 50-50 cabinet for sure. So I think you're right, Kathy, that's a, you know, in the, in the complicated algorithm that is cabinet making, that's going to continue to, to be, uh, you know, a, a, a challenge for sure. Um, you know, Having a mayor to Fino is a good thing. That's right, yeah, but uh, that's, that's not in the new territory uh, kind of uh, cases, no. Um, uh, Colin uh, Whalen asked, would you expect coalition rifts and the Liberals to play out more so inside of leadership race or external? So I mean, obviously there's a leadership race coming, uh, you know, as soon as a year probably, uh, you know, is that is that the way that this should happen for this, the revitalization of the party, or is it uh, actually a, a tough part for them that they're going to have, uh, uh, you know, they're going to have this not having an interim leader, they're keeping uh, the, the retiring leader in place for the time being. Any thoughts? Well, wasn't there, I forget who it was, but one of the, the liberal candidates like already tweeted that we need an interim leader and then immediately deleted that. Um, but that sounds like it won't be smooth sailing for the for the party for the next year until they until they elect a new leader. Yeah, I mean, I think they're 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 definitely <laughs> have some some issues with you know the fact that the sort of splits are kind of evident already. Uh, you know, with other tweets that have been coming out this morning and willingness uh, just in terms of uh, speaking, uh, and then obviously not necessarily a whole lot of people. Some of the people who've been bandied about, uh, Diane Watts and Jazz Johal, at least for now, have said not interested. Uh, and so, you know, that that means that some of the uh, you know the, the faces that might help with some of that renewal are already sort of bowing out. No, I, I have two thoughts. Yeah, Dick. Two thoughts. One is I read the uh, tortured prose in the Sun yesterday to suggest that the that Wilkinson's um, intent to stay on was interpreted as expressing willingness to serve, <laughs> which for which the answer may be thanks but no thanks. Uh, that I you know I think the tension in the the tension in the senior ranks of the party is palpable. Um, but second, you know, part of that, you know, part of the story of Canadian politics is that, to a great extent, uh, it is through leadership selection processes that parties renew or fail to, as the case may be. Certainly, that's the federal liberal story uh, almost every time. Uh, and the few times where that hasn't happened, they've paid for it. Um, so it may be, given the way in which at least the Liberal Party, if not the NDP, is constructed, um, there may be no other way to have a real one than the leadership race. Although to the extent that there is some sort of institutional integrity, I don't mean that in a moral term, just in you know, real institutional uh, strength, I, I think they would be well advised to have a conversation about this, possibly in private, given the nature of the issues in play here. But I, I do think, and I noticed this is kind of coming up in a number of the questions, that they, they got to ask themselves how they want to balance uh, social conservatism, which is a real fact in British Columbia. We don't, not, British Columbians don't all live in the lower mainland. And much of the province is effectively like Alberta um, and, uh, and, and less liberal than Edmonton or Calgary. Uh, and so I think this, these are real questions. And, but at the end of the day, probably it will have to be fought out as a leadership battle. And, Thank and then, we, we, then we'll see what happens after that. Uh, Megan and you, Dick, are both uh, had pieces in the the Thai sort of reflecting on the election, and in addition to that, Tom Hawthorne, I think it was, who said that the Liberals ran a great campaign for for rural Alberta. Uh, you know, in the sense that uh, I, mean, I think it's interesting that uh, you know the claim is that social conservative issues, you know, and Megan pointed to this as well, hurt them in places like Vancouver, uh, but didn't help them taking a long time to apologize for the things in the Fraser Valley. They were not seen as, you know, by actually apologizing, they were hurting themselves or by throwing, throwing us out. So uh, that I think reveals very deeply the, the challenge that they're going to have going forward that, you know, you're not pleasing. And they're more likely to show up as my Vias's uh, comment also makes that three guys holding wags at signs are going to get more attention than, than the, uh, 
sort of steady hands of uh, Metro Vancouver or the UBC varsity basketball team, the case may be. Uh, maybe it's rugby now that is where those people come from. I'm not sure. <laughs> Dick knows varsity sports better than I do. Uh, <laughs> uh, Thomas O'Donnell asks, what, what do you think future wannabe candidates can learn from this election? Uh, that's a great question is, uh, for our IFL participants as well. <laughs> what, what, do, what do they need to know about uh, running in the future? Megan, do you want to try that one? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this was a, it was a tough election. Um, and it was an election where, like, thinking of the IFL and thinking of all of the, the training we do to get people ready to campaign, a lot of that wasn't true for campaigning kind of in a virtual era. So I think there was, you know, that adds a lot to it. Um, but I think we also, I mean, the nature of snap elections, I think we did see people stepping up and saying, well, somebody needs to do it. Um, and so I, I will do it. Um, and I think, I think that's great. And I think parties, you know, reaching out to, to more of those people and preparing those people. Um, I mean, in the, in the IFL too, we talk specifically, we do a lot of stuff on cross-partisanship. And I think that aspect of, of this election and, and specifically, you know, the Greens kind of um, narrative around this election of the NDP are breaking this collaborative agreement we had. Um, I think there's questions there of, you know, when do, does partisanship trump and like you know, partisan wanting to win, wanting your party to have a majority when does that come into play and kind of trump the uh, the more cross-partisan work? When there's an election? <laughs> you know, the bets are off. Screw, yeah. com yeah, screw co you know, uh, cooperation. For, uh, it's election time. Yeah, I mean, uh, there was a lot of talk before the election, I think, about particularly on healthcare, Adrian Dix and his critic, uh, you know, working together all the time. Uh, his critic did get reelected, uh, you know, so uh, that, that uh, you know, goodwill perhaps for that. Uh, you know, well, uh, I you know, also, was also in Kelowna, so it wasn't a big surprise. Uh, you know, it's part of the heartland of where the liberals are going to stay. But yes, sorry, Megan. I mean, do we do we expect to see that going forward? I mean, even on issues around the pandemic, do we expect to see that same kind of cross-partisan work? Fool me once, uh, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it's certainly possible, and and certainly, uh, you know, the tone that um, I mean, the Greens might be in a less cooperative. I mean, they obviously have less opportunity to cooperate, and less vital to get their cooperation, but they also might be in a much more, uh, you know, much more willing to 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 go right after everything. And although, again, and frankly, they were pretty tough on on the issues that mattered to them, like Site C, uh, in terms of criticizing the government when they were their coalition partner, or at least their their helper. Um, Simon asks, what would it take for the NDP to govern boldly on climate and abandon their moderate stance? Kathy, do you want to field that one? They've actually done some really bold things on transportation, on buildings. Um, and, you know, the, the, the dirty secret of BC's climate leadership is coal. Um, you know, most of the time, the number one export from Vancouver's harbor is coal, and the Liberals have been beholden to the the mining companies. The NDP has been beholden to the steelworkers and the longshoremen forever. Um, but we don't burn our own coal, so we've been able to, you know, pretend that's not there. But the big issue is LNG, and um, you know, I think that John Horgan is. Um, a fan of big projects for the construction unions. Um, I think that the NDP was frightened, uh, took, a, took a big lesson away from the, um, their defeat under Adrian Dix when they became the party of no, and so they feel like they need to support some sort of big job creating development, and LNG is the looming one. Um, you know, there's two possibilities. One of them is that um, BC and Canada will accept a, a sort of temporary strategy of purchasing international credits to offset the emissions within BC from extraction and liquefaction of gas. Um, and uh, the other possibility, and this is the um, 
for Canada's oil industry as well is that the rest of the world will put our fossil fuel exports out of business. That action to move um, economies other than Canada's away from fossil fuels will um, limit markets for fossil fuels and we will not be competitive when that happens. I think you're muted still. Kath, do you think that Horgan is now in a position, particularly given the report that's about to come in to ax Sightsee? Will he, do you think? No, I don't think he will. Uh, you know, um, but it, you know, it could be a real challenge. <laughs> I mean, one of the things is that, um, that the, and it, something that the environmental contingent within the NDP doesn't like to talk about is the degree to which getting to net zero within British Columbia and across Canada is going to turn on electrification. Um, now, you know, big projects, people don't like, they want run of river, but the thing about big projects is that they deliver a lot of hydro. Um, and that is a competitive advantage for Canada. Um, and so, yeah, it is, you know, there'll be a big um, report coming out from the Canadian Institute of Climate Choices in the next, I don't know, month, six weeks, um, showing, you know, the, this, the importance of electrification in Canada's path to net zero. Um, carbon capture and sequestration is the other wild card there. But yeah, I, I'd be surprised um, if BC pulls the plug. So even even though the seismic story is getting dire, this is something that could be spun as actually an environmental choice, notwithstanding the that, that there just isn't enough generation potential in all the more micro. Well, it's we need the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions in British Columbia is transportation. I think that's about 37 or 38 percent of our emissions. And those are, that's coming from driving around in gasoline and diesel powered vehicles. Now, either we stop people from traveling around or we move them to electric vehicles, biofuels. Um, um, you know, I don't think we're going to see biogas um, on the scale that we need. And so electrification or hydrogen maybe in, in Alberta, but electrification sort of looms largest as the substitute for um, fossil fuels and transportation. And you know, so if people say, well, we're just BC and we're an island and screw the rest of <laughs> the world, it's easier. We, you know, we have lots of, um, lots of electricity, but if BC wants to play a role in um, making a, uh, hydroelectricity more available to other provinces or U.S. states. Um, I think Site C looms larger there. So uh, Sarah asks Megan uh, about equity, and so Megan, you're, you're uh, you know, both of us uh, so highlighted uh, the sort of uh, steady state of of diversity in terms of ethnicity, uh, steady state in terms of uh, gender diversity uh, in the House. Uh, you know. The, the mand equity mandate is there on the NDP side, uh, but what are some of the things that might uh, change that? I mean, is this a blip like turnout is, or uh, is there something stalled about that uh, sort of progress toward uh, some of those equalities? Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I think with, with so many things this election, because of the weird nature of the election, it's kind of hard to say how much we we're gonna say, like this speaks to BC politics at large. Um, I do think, you know, um, the NDP, it's probably, not, the equity mandate is not enough. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of research has shown in, in specifically recruiting women, but, but also, you know, recruiting people of color and indigenous people, it's a, it's a pipeline issue. It's a question of who's asked to run, who's in the networks that running is common. Um, so I think a lot of work needs to, you know, continued work to reach out to those groups, to build those networks, to ask, to say like, you know, you should run, um, please run. Um, and when you run, and I think that's also where the NDP is going to, you know, um, going forward to look for, um, you have a voice at the table, you will be heard in the legislature, you're not just, you know, sitting here. Um, and I think too, you know, and, and there's also policies that, um, that make it easier, you know, women 
often uh, have more family and care responsibilities. There are things like that where, you know, making um, even policies outside of kind of elections and candidate recruitment, those can make a difference on who's able to run. Um, so it's a, it's a complicated thing, um, but definitely there's a lot more to do than just the equity mandate. Nick spoke of evangelism. Uh, we, we have uh, we have trained people evangelism, so uh, <laughs> you know make people feel comfortable in the possible role, right? And that's really been one of our goals with IFL as well, is to give people uh, that chance to see that. And you know we have a very diverse cohorts in, in those programs, and so I think you know helping people to see that if we were to plug something in the midst of this uh, serious academic discussion, that's what we would plug. Uh, Kathy, there's a question for you about, uh, is there a chance the anticipated climate change plan would ever impose a cap on fleet limits for ride hailing companies like Uber and Lyft? Um, I haven't heard that discussed in the, the mix. Um, and really the vast majority of cars on the road are not ride hailing. <laughs> They're all of us getting around in our cars. Um, so I think um, what's already in the Clean BC plan is a commitment to ban the sale of gasoline powered or fossil fuel powered vehicles by 2040. Um, I think there's potential, particularly if um, Joe Biden gets elected in the US to move that deadline up sooner. So I think we will see an emphasis on zero emission vehicle mandates um, as a as a way to reduce emissions from the entire fleet of vehicles heavy vehicles present special challenges and there was some you know some good nerdy stuff in the ndp platform about that dick would you mind saying anything about um you know the kind of contrasting leadership and how that uh, you know i mean just in terms of voter behavior generally uh, how leaders are uh, you know, evaluated and whether you think that maybe had any effect, uh, you know, that Weaver sort of slow to respond to things, or sorry, Wilkinson slow to respond to things, uh, Horgan being kind of premier dad, uh, but also first to know kind of big bump, uh, particularly through the debate in terms of people being quite impressed with her as a, a candidate. Did leadership have anything to do with the outcome? I, I don't think it, for the, for the liberals, I don't think it had any marginal effect as a campaign phenomenon. You know, I think that the, the, the big problem for Andrew Wilkinson was that uh, survey data are to be believed, British Columbians overwhelmingly approved of the job that the, the government had done. Now they were approving a, of a job that the government had done with the cooperation of the other parties. So there's a, you know, back to the fool me twice story here that, uh, that I think it's a, it is a bitter pill that both parties have to swallow. So I think that that you know if there's a, if there's a Wilkinson story, uh, it would have been in place even before he didn't help himself, um, but he was at a structural disadvantage. It's, it seems to me. I think Sonia Firstenow did help herself. I mean, certainly that was my reaction in the debate. I was quite surprised at how it all worked because I really had no sense of her really, uh, and uh, uh, not only did she express herself with a kind of efficiency and economy uh, but she also uh, you know that she resisted the temptation to do what minor parties do which is to promise the moon right i mean when we talk about fake platforms the fake platforms say of the last federal election weren't the liberal and conservative ones they were the ndp platforms right because you don't, you know, you don't have to live by that. Well, she sort of refrained from that. I mean, the, the green platform is very aspirational, but when she presented herself in the debate, what she did was present herself as someone who had been at the table and making the difficult decisions around, amongst other things, fighting the pandemic. And I thought that was brilliant. Uh, that there was a sort of she 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 presented herself in a in a kind of show don't tell way, which uh, which I think helped. Now it's hard to detect uh, a whole lot of that in the flow of the campaign, but the fact is that if you look at the last couple of polls, that the the Greens had ticked up uh, in all the polls, so that suggests it isn't just some sampling blip. And then of course the election day number is at, I, I'm guessing is at least sixteen percent, and it might go up a bit. Because in fact, the green writings were, were among those that had the biggest uh, 
volume of requests for a mail-in ballot. So, you know, she might actually get the party quite close to where it was in 2017. Uh, and, and I think she, she can take credit for that. Can I ask a question, Dick, um, about Wilkinson? Because um, it's very hard for me to separate my I'm a political scientist from I'm a woman in how I react to Andrew Wilkinson. Oh. And anyone in this day and age who can refer to um, domestic violence as being in a tough marriage or to see a video of a major party leader in Canadian politics chuckling as uh, one of his candidates is making sexist remarks about an elected member of the provincial legislature. I mean, those were just punches in the gut for me. And I'm curious what has happened with um, the gender, whether anything has happened with the gender gap in support for the NDP versus liberals, nothing. Well, I. I I'm, I'm not just during the election. We could go back. We could go back to the press releases of the polling firms to see what the numbers are, but I, I, I just haven't had the time to to do that. And and we don't. I don't. I don't think we have academic data. Maybe maybe Vote Compass will be released in the, eventually. But uh, uh, I mean, I mean, I think that that what you say is all true, and I think there's been you know that's part of the blowback inside the party. Uh, against him, and and uh, I, I would say that there's a, you know, God save us from Rhodes scholars. I mean, there's a sort of there's a sort of tone deafness about him that it, that basically applies to everything. So so you know so why not women? Why not domestic abuse? I mean, there is a such he, he, he I mean I I'll, I'll tell you stories offline, but I mean, the the guy does not exhibit. The ordinary political impulses, uh, which are of course manipulative and sly and strategic, but that's what they're there for. And and he just didn't seem to have any of that stuff. And I guess on the question of leadership, much was made of the fact that you know it took four ballots and he only you know he only won on the last one. That's that is just generically a bad way to win the leadership of a party. Right? If you look at the record of candidates who kind of come up the middle, squeak over the line at the end. It's not good, right? I mean, our friend Stefan is among these, of course, but Sheer, uh, Joe Clark, um, and so, and uh, a few NDP candidates from the 80s come to mind as well. Um, that, um, uh, you know, I don't know if there's a lesson in there for the, the next liberal leader, if there is one, but, uh, uh, Wilkinson was a kind of afterthought leader of the party, and now we know why. Uh, I mentioned before Colin Whalen is on the call here. Colin, do you mind saying anything about, do you see anything in the gender gap for the work from Innovative Research Group or, or not? Uh, I couldn't comment. We, we did not end up doing um, really any any serious work around the election for a variety of reasons. So unfortunately, I wish I wish I could share amazing, wonderful insights, but I I don't have anything to share. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you in an awkward spot. But thank no, you. no, no, that's that's fine. No, that's that's I, really fine. Yeah, I was I gonna actually, say, do you want to add anything? I actually googled this um, when I was preparing for last night because I was like, I like Kathy it was like, there must be a gender gap, um, and I didn't I didn't see it in my kind of like five or six polls that I went through, there was definitely no press releases saying like women are, are moving away. That's not to say that it wasn't wasn't there, but it was not something I saw, or at least the polling firms I was looking at were like highlighting as something to watch for. I've, I've seen some of the Vote Compass data and it's interesting what a big, what a huge gender gap there is on um, an extractive economy. So, men versus women on LNG, on Site C, um, on pipelines. Uh, the, the gap is very big there. Yeah, I, I mean, I was advise, or advised, I was consulted on some of the questions for Compass. I, I thought they had a hard time making good polarizations of party uh, decision, uh, party platforms, essentially. I couldn't get them to sort of embrace uh, 
a law and order approach to, to drug regulation versus a, a harm reduction approach, you know, as, as one that would clearly sort of signal a difference between liberals and, and the NDP. And so I'm not sure what we'll get. It, there was a lot of resistance every time we tried to, to push on, on some of those kinds of questions. Um, uh, Max Gardner asks about uh, transit, not surprisingly, because he's a he's a transit buff. But I think it speaks to the broader uh, question of you know the cat he was pointing to as well. You know, what's going to happen uh, going forward in terms of these big infrastructure projects, the rebuilding stuff, and the per perilousness of both municipal, federal, uh, and provincial finances. Uh, Kathy, do you have anything to add on that? You know, big promises for transit funding um, from the NDP and from the federal liberals. Um, you know, a, a good time to be a numtot uh, with, you know, promises of SkyTrain extension, Canada Line, money from um, province and federal government, both it's sort of this moment to um, stimulate the economy with green projects. Um, but tr trouble on the financing side, right? Yeah, no, they will, it will contribute to the deficit, um, but I guess they're the kinds of things, once you commit money to them, you don't like leave a hole in the ground down Broadway. Um, you know, they are, uh, they were popular promises. They're things that both levels of governments have said they're gonna do. They're actually needed in a big way to um, reconcile our economies with our climate ambitions. So, you know, I think it's probably a good time for transit investment. For people if I may, never, will people get on the transit? <laughs> if I may, I think this is something that Jazz Johel mentioned. That uh, you know that the that the <laughs> sorry about this. <laughs> we'll just have to wait this out. Invite emeritus professors onto panels, and you get. <laughs> anyway. Uh, you know that that the relationship, especially of the Clark government of Vancouver, on transit was poisonous. And this is you know this is Max's honors thesis and his MA thesis. And and uh, you know that's those days are behind us. I think uh, at least as long as the NDP are in power. So this is another thing. The the stars are aligned in that respect as well. Perhaps bad news for places where the where the digging hasn't started. So. Massey tunnel replacement may be a little longer <laughs> away if, if they haven't really gotten to work on the project versus ones that are kind of already started, uh, perhaps. Um, maybe we should take a moment now if does anybody wants to I just ask our three panelists if there's a, a final reflection they want to offer uh, before I offer some thanks to, to people who help put this together. Uh, let's go in reverse order. So Kathy, last reflections from you. I mean, it's a, you know, the NDP got their majority and they've got a really challenging time ahead of them. <laughs> um, I wish them well. Great, uh, Dick? Well, um, I, I think that, uh, that we're, we're, I think we're probably going to find ourselves going back to at least some measure of the polarization, which is, historically part of BC politics. I think that the last legislature was not a harbinger of the future. I think it was uh, um, a, a blip, blessed for some, uh, but I think that probably the logic of the situation is gonna drive the parties apart and especially so if, if the upshot of the liberals rethinking of themselves pushes them to the right, which it may do. And, uh, elsewhere, Kathy has talked about how kind of deficit politics is, is kind of, is, it's not nice politics, it's kind of mean-spirited politics. And I think that's probably down the road for us uh, as we try to figure out what to do with the fiscal damage that the pandemic has created. Megan? These comments are making me really, really nervous. Um, yeah, I mean, I also, I'm struggling with, with what to say here. I think the NDP they have the majority, it's, we'll see what they do with it. I think we also, it's so hard to look, at least for me, to look beyond the pandemic, because um, I think I'm thinking a lot of, you know, what are they gonna do right now? What's the situation with the second wave? Does this really matter for that, for the pandemic response? 
Um, it doesn't matter that the NDP have a majority, but looking beyond that, you know, what else are they going to be able to do? What, what kind of different policies are we going to see in the province? Um, Great. Thanks, Megan. Um, I mean, I, I'll just reiterate that the manipulative side of, I mean, as the numbers grow, you know, the, the timing of the gamble of, on the Premier's part seems, in hindsight anyway, uh, you know, 2020, because he per picked a perfect time just as the numbers are starting to spike a little bit. He's He's got secured that majority. So uh, it's a it's a, a lesson for other Premiers thinking about these things, whether they got it in, in on top, they're on top of it or not. So uh, I want to thank uh, all our audience for showing up, uh, the regular CompCan group, but also uh, alumni and others who uh, chose to join us. Uh, I want to thank our panelists, Kathy, Megan, and, and, and Dick. Thank you very much for your insights. Uh, I also want to thank Brent uh, Holmes for putting uh, together some of the technical side of things. Eve uh, for asking us to do this uh, in replacement of a normal CompCan uh, session. And Rebecca Monorat, who everyone knows uh, from CSDI, for also helping us put together some of uh, the the, um, the organizational stuff behind it. So uh, we've had a lot of uh, election stuff. It's not over. CSDI is doing more. Political science is doing more on the U.S. election as it comes. Uh, so you'll see some of these same people. Uh, watch out for those events as they're coming, uh, and we hope to see you at some of those. Uh, but thank you, everybody, for your attention today and, and your participation. Thanks very much.